Okay, so let's look at the structure of those uh, those myofilaments in more detail so that we can talk about how muscles actually contract, how they do what they do. Um, so looking at the thick filaments, myosin in green, right here on the slide, uh, we've got a myosin filament, and myosin protein, and it has, if you'll notice here, it's got these big globby things hanging off of it. Those are called the myosin heads. Um, those myosin heads have two binding sites. Each of these would have two binding sites. They have a binding site for ATP, an energy molecule, and then they also have a binding site for actin. Actin is shown in purple in this schematic. Um, so again, that's our thin filament in purple. Here's our thick filament in green. And there has to be a way for these two fibers to, to connect to each other. It's through the action of these myosin heads. So the interesting thing with actin is that ordinarily, just if a muscle is at rest, um, ordinarily on actin, there are some proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, and those proteins block the binding site of myosin. But right now, I just would like for you to notice these two different conformations. So this myosin head, uh, right now it has bound an ATP molecule. It has not hydrolyzed the ATP yet. Okay, so this is an intact ATP. And the myosin head group is kind of like bent over like that. The other possible confirmation is over here on the right. The myosin head has straightened out, um, and you'll notice now it's instead of binding ATP, it's bound to the hydrolyzed form. It has split off an inorganic phosphate, um, and it's used the energy from that to undergo a confirmation change. We'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, I'd like to focus in on what's going on with, with the, the actin for just a second. So these actin proteins um, have tropomyosin, that sort of pink band, and also troponin um, bound to them. This is the ordinary structure for actin at rest. Um, so these troponins are attached to tropomyosin, and tropomyosin is blocking the binding site um, for the thick filaments. So all the binding sites are blocked. Um, it's not possible for a bridge to be formed between the thick and thin filaments right now. What has to happen is tropomyosin needs to be rolled out of the way. It has to be moved. And the way that that takes place is through the action of calcium. So calcium is very important. It, in fact, it is essential. It's necessary in order for muscle contractions to take place. And this is why. Um, so when a muscle cell is stimulated, when, when a muscle contraction is going to take place, calcium gets released into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. What the calcium does is it comes over, it binds to troponin, and then it makes troponin sort of move out of the way. Troponin pulls tropomyosin with it. Um, so this ends up causing this whole sort of pink thread, that's tropomyosin, this whole pink thread rolls out of the way and then the binding site is exposed for myosin. Um, so when calcium is present, just to recap that, calcium causes troponin to move, that in turn pulls tropomyosin with it and exposes the binding site for myosin. So now this myosin head group can bind to actin and then a contraction can take place. So what happens uh, once this binding takes place, on to the next slide, okay, this is called a cross bridge. A cross bridge has been formed between the thick and thin filaments inside of the muscle cell. All right, so at rest, um, so contraction has not happened yet, but calcium is present. So contraction is ready to take place. All right, so calcium has caused the, the uh, tropomyosin to move out of the way. And here we have um, binding is just about to happen. So myosin um, has hydrolyzed ATP and it's gonna use that energy, right? To undergo that conformation change. So now it's ready to go, um, binds to the actin. And then what happens is it kicks out that phosphate group, the inorganic phosphate, doesn't need it anymore, so it gets rid of it. And um, that results in a conformation change, a shape change in the, the myosin head. So notice again, okay, we're going from sort of those straightened conformation to now down here we've got the bent conformation for the myosin head. That is causing the actin to slide relative to myosin. So that is the contraction process right there. It's due to this cross bridge activity. Once, uh, once that conformation change takes place, the myosin head gets reloaded with a new ATP molecule, a new energy molecule, and it's ready to do the whole process again. So it's gonna keep just sort of ratcheting along these two filaments, um, sliding them into a more overlapped conformation.
Okay, so this is going on, we're just looking at one particular myosin head. Keep in mind, this is going on all over the place. There are a ton of myosin heads all staggered along one individual um, myosin sort of unit in one individual sarcomere. Um, and on top of that, there are many of these filaments throughout the entire muscle. So there are lots of these cross bridges being formed. And um, each time myosin undergoes this shape change, that's called a power stroke. It's like a power stroke it's driving the, the actin filament um, in the opposite direction as the myosin filament. Okay, so how is all of this initiated? This is sort of the process. You'll want to know this process, by the way. This is really key. This is how muscles do what they do. Um, how is all of this initiated in the first place? This is where the nervous system is going to come into play, come back over. Um, we're very familiar with the nervous system. Um, but let's just go through some reminders. Okay, so we've got a motor neuron here shown in yellow, and this motor neuron, okay, if there's an action potential traveling down it, then what happens at the axon terminal is we can have a neurotransmitter that gets released. So vesicles will fuse and dump the neurotransmitter into, um, into the, the space there at the end. So when we're talking about the nervous system, uh, we were focused in on nerve cells and we had a synapse between two nerve cells. The thing that's different here is we have a synapse between a neuron and a muscle cell. Okay, so as far as the nerve cell is concerned, sort of the same process, action potential travels down the axon and when it gets to the end, we have a neurotransmitter that gets released. Do you remember what the neurotransmitter was? Um, acetylcholine was the first neurotransmitter we learned about. This is the really key neurotransmitter for muscles. So acetylcholine um, gets released from the neuron and it comes over and it binds to some nicotinic receptors right there. This little space on the, on the muscle cell, excuse me, this little space on the muscle cell is called a motor end plate. This is the spot where um, acetylcholine is going to bind and activate something to take place in the muscle cell. So when it binds, we're familiar with this. We know that this can result in depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. And that results in a wave just like, well, it's an action potential, um, just like we've seen before in the nervous system. Um, that depolarization wave will travel out throughout uh, the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. So that action potential travels and muscle cells have these interesting channels. Um, this is called a T-tubule, a transverse tubule. It just kind of cuts right through the muscle cell. Um, we'll see this, I'll show you another picture of this on the next slide. Um, but this depolarization wave travels through the transverse tubule and that causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So right here, calcium floods in um, to the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. And um, the inter there's an interesting kind of bridge right here. So in purple, if you can see this, actually, let me see if I can zoom in on this. I think I can. Um, yeah. Okay, so in purple, we have got, oops, ah, I can't combine my tools here. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll describe it. So in purple, we have the voltage-gated calcium channels. And see how they're physically connected to the orange channels right there? Those are channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So sarcoplasmic reticulum, this is just the endoplasmic reticulum inside of a muscle cell. And remember, this is the site where calcium is stored. So we want to keep, in general, we keep calcium concentrations low in the cytoplasm and the endoplasmic reticulum is a good place to keep it. Um, so we've got calcium shown in, as little pink dots here. Um, the calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and when these voltage gated calcium channels open and what happens is that also causes the channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. So this is kind of a two for one deal. That action potential travels down the transverse tubule, causes these channels to be opened. That allows calcium to flood out into the cytoplasm. Okay, and then from there, we know what it does. It's gonna go over to the sarcomeres, cause tropomyosin to roll away from the binding sites, and a contraction can happen at that point. Let me just show you this other picture. 
this does a good job of just kind of showing the overall structure. So we're looking at, in this picture, we're looking at a muscle fiber. So again, think one muscle cell. Um, by the way, muscle cells, they can have multiple nuclei, and that's because they are, they are derived from, in the amuronic stage, we have multiple cells that fuse together, and this ends up creating a, a long fiber structure. It's because multiple cells fuse together. So anyway, we call this whole thing a muscle fiber. And muscle fibers, uh, if you look at this overall structure, they are really intricate inside in terms of the structure. So we've got the sarcolemma on the outside, that's shown kind of in pink here. We've got these little pores, those are the transverse tubules that we were talking about. And so the action potential, wherever it comes from, um, can travel through the through the sarcolemma and then sort of cut through um, via those transverse tubules. So this is sort of a, a you can see right there in pink, that's sort of a channel that goes all the way through the cell. It's a channel of um, plasma membrane, basically. Okay, so we've got those interspersed throughout. And then in green, what's being shown in green is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's the site where calcium is stored. Um, okay, so when those action potentials travel through the T-tubules, the transverse tubules, that leads to opening of those voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so that's happening right here inside of the T-tubule. Voltage-gated calcium channels open. That causes some calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm of the cell. Here's the interesting thing. Uh, this, is, this is an example of positive feedback. You know, the presence of some calcium in the cytoplasm that causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release even more calcium. And the reason for that is because the sarcoplasmic reticulum, its membrane also has ligand-gated calcium channels, and they're gated by calcium. So the presence of calcium causes more calcium release channels to open, and so calcium just floods out into the muscle cell, into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. And that really allows um, contractions to happen quickly, so that there's enough calcium available for the whole, um, as many as many um, contractile units to contract as needed. All right. Uh, so interesting note here with the calcium release channels. When calcium is being released, these channels are really big. They're ten times larger than voltage-gated calcium channels. So again, this just this allows a huge flood of calcium to come out all at once. When the contraction is done, um, all of that calcium has to be pumped back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It has to be stored. And so that's a big part of the energy use. That's part of the energy use of muscle cells is just pumping all of that calcium back in. This has to be an active transport mechanism, right? Because it would be pumping calcium up its concentration gradient. So active transport brings it back in. So muscle relaxation. Again, at this point, um, action potentials have to be ceased, otherwise calcium is going to keep leaving the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, so action potentials stop, and then also the calcium release channels have to close. They do because of the, um, the membrane potential at that point. Um, we've got the calcium pumps, ATPase pumps, bring the calcium back inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And at that point, since there's no more calcium in the cytoplasm, troponin and tropomyosin roll back into place and they block the binding sites on actin so that myosin can no longer bind to it. So that's, that means that there's not going to be any more contraction going on until the next action potential arrives. So all of that, that was a lot of information, that is uh, summarized nicely in this figure, so you can check that out.